G'day, it's my pleasure to invite um, Callum Mac McKenzie back for his second talk. Um, in case you missed the first one, it was number 144. And uh, I advise you to go back and listen to that. It was very interesting. Um, it was a mixture of um, very humorous moments as well as um, some very good combat stories. And uh, judging by the list of um, the second talk, it's also going to be an interesting one. And towards the end, we'll be chatting about what it was like being territorial soldiers because we had um, different stresses put upon us versus the regulars. Um, so, Mac, it's uh, lovely to have you back on the screen. And um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you. Thanks, Tony. Yes. <clears throat> I realised in the first talk I was, I was trying to do everything in, in, in chronological order. But, you know, you'd remember one thing and you'd go off on a slight tangent and then, and then you'd, you'd completely lose what you, what you actually wanted to discuss. So even this now, it's I'm trying to put it chronologically, but but uh, I, I I when I was actually working it out, it's almost like 1979 didn't exist, and everything happened in, in 77 and 78. Like and I thought, no, that's, that's bullshit because I know I know we were really, really very busy there. So the first thing I'd like to mention is that <clears throat> the famous Chris Schulenberg. Surely we did a camp down in the valley. Um, <clears throat> SAS were based at um, the uh, I think it was Musangezi. And, and our company, so they were on one bank and our company um, headquarters were on the other bank, but our platoon base was down by the Angba. We were doing the normal daytime border patrols. That, and the locals were still there. In those days, there was no curfew. <clears throat> locals were in the area. And we came up to this local, my, my little stick, and uh, said to this guy, have you seen any tours? He said, yeah. He said, they just, they just came past here. So we kind of thought, oh, well, you know, this is a normal bullshit story. So we said, how many? So the guy says, ah, oh, about 8,100, you see. So now the other guys in my stick, they're like, what the hell is this? So then I said, man, you know these guys count 1, 14, 29, 44. I said, you yeah. so, so, so I said, well, can you show us where they were? And then he took us to this part. I'll tell you what, Tony, I think that even Stevie Wonder could have, could have tracked those guys. It was unbelievable. What had happened is that a, a group of about 20 or 18 or so had come across, and they had um, uh, porters carrying all landmines and, and, and RPG rockets and stuff like that. So there were, in fact, about 80. <clears throat> so anyway, I got, I got on the blur, absolutely shitting myself now when I saw how many tracks with me. And uh, Schulenberg and, a, and a, he, was, he was a Luton SAS at that stage. Schulenberg and a, and a corporal came out. Uh, they jumped out, of the, jumped out of the chopper. They had a look. They started to, uh, we started to track. And then what happened was that another, another stick of ours quite further in, from the border, they they um, they cross grained and they picked up the tracks. So that so they were even fresher because by this stage I think it was probably about 10, 12 o'clock in the in, in the morning. So then I had to call the choppers and the choppers came and came and picked up Schulenberg in the tracker and then they they leapfrogged it ahead. They tracked and uh, they slipped on tracks and the next morning the, the guys had a contact. And the bloke I was telling you about Yanni Baton, um, the guy was wounded. Yanni Yanni was actually in that stick that that. Um, they didn't say, and the guys had actually had to hold him back. He just wanted to shoot these these, these captured guys. <laughs> and the funny, the funny thing was that Tony, we had, I think, I think there was there were four there were four guys killed and one guy captured, and they had like I, don't know, I think it was um, six weapons or something. So some somebody tried to hide an AK because the one weapon that was that was captured was an RPD. So special branch who were, who were also there by close to 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 SAS. They had the capture. They said, okay, who was the guy with the RPD? Because actually, you know, the guy with the RPD normally is the is the main manner. And, uh, and so, so they had the bodies there. said, no, no, that guy's okay. That guy's okay. And I don't, okay. So now it's an ISP. It's like, we, uh, you know, where's this missing AK? Because we've got, yeah, fine, we've got five weapons. It's four AKs and one RPD. And nobody, nobody there was. So anyway, so the guy, so the one guy came out. Uh, I can't remember it was an SAS car, one of our guys. And, and uh, it must have fallen out of the helicopter or something. <laughs> but the funny thing was that, <clears throat> um, in, in, engineers came in to try and find this arms cache because this is what the guys were bringing for an arms cache. And the normal story, they were searching, searching, searching. The one engineer went to went to have a shit, and as he dug into the ground with his banker, they found this. They found this arms arms cache, all these landmines and RPGs and, and ammo and everything like that. So that was that was kind of thing. Now the amazing thing was that so that was the first I saw shooting. I didn't know well, at that stage. He, well, he probably was a legend in SAS, but but nobody knew about him. And <clears throat> I used to play rugby at, uh, at Forces Rugby Club in, 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 in Salisbury. And Schillenberg came along and he said to our coach, can I, can I play? So the coach said, yeah, but you have to play in the second team because the first team, you know, we've got the guys and the guys are training. 
And he was, and he was really dark. He's very smart. And this guy used to come about eight months. And I mean, no training, no nothing. Cheesy, he was bloody fit. And I remember our coach, Rod Aves, he really, like, I mean, he <clears throat> he had nothing to do with the SS, but I think already the myth of Shuli, he was in SS, was, was was still very well known. So, so he played. He played about two two games for our um, <clears throat> for our second system. Whenever, whenever he was back, he was back in uh, back in Salisbury. And that. I mean, the other thing I was thinking about Tony was that. <clears throat> You know when we did when we did our first hockey uh, hockey camp and that was that was in seventy seven that was probably about June July seventy seven <clears throat> that's where we really had all the fun again. But the camp before the Matassa camp, the first time we operated with with uh, with Lindsay Treadwell, he um, if I actually look at it, that was the precursor of of, of of how the war was was really well for us territorials was was really um, um, potting up. You know that was that was the first time we operated. We, we had some, we had our tracking stick with CJ Hasbrook and. We had we had about three scenes there. The, 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 the one the one I'd like to talk about. Our guys got revs. They'd actually been compromised. So what they did was that the normal story. They just because they've been seeing the day, they went to a BC. They sat down there, had some cokes, and then what they were going to do is that they're going to then move off in the opposite direction and then come back to a, to, to a different OP. And why? And just as it was getting dark, the the Gooks ambushed them on the on the stoop of the of the of the general store. <laughs> And about seven o'clock at night, these guys were still being rammed. So they actually brought a lynx out from, from Grand Reef, and, uh, and the guy dropped one of these thousand candlewood fairs, and that was it. So that was, that was the end of that. And at that stage, um, um, RAR had, with the fire force, but RAR had gone to another scene where, where our guys had sighted tours, so, and they were still out in, the, out in the bush. So when the choppers came in the morning to pick them up, they picked up my stick and, 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 and CJ and our tracking stick. And then we then we then flew onto onto the spoor, and then they dropped us, and they carried on to pick up to pick up the RER. And when we were tracking, um, this is when I tell you my first talk about the, about the the local that we shot. The we we got to like a, 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 a an upland valley, and the, and the, and the paths the paths split into two. So CJ and one other guy from his from his oh, sorry. I think CJ went and he just gave one tracker with me, a guy called Brian Minnie, he was also a corporal as well. So we it was because the, the sport actually did, did split up. And we were going on and then and then this is when this 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 local started chatting my soldiers, my soldiers, and she started to run. And Brian Minnie, the the, the the tracker, he shouted to her, Imai, Mira, Mira, you know, mother, stop, stop, stop that, you know. And she just kept on running. And I, I knew what was gonna happen, so I just took off. I was I was running to go and go and go and grab hold of her. And Brian shot and hit her hit her in the thigh. And anyway, we, we then had, because she was wounded, and as I said, the, the turns were in the village being, being fed, and they, and they gapped it. So we had a call up for a, a civilian as a back. Air Force were not happy. Huh? Air Force were not happy at all. Uh, guy picked her up and, and, and came back to and, 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 and as, 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 they were, as they were lifting off, the pilot said, and please understand, this is the last civilian as we will do for you now. So that was it. So anyway, we, came, we carried on tracking, um, and this is where CJ, uh, CJ Osbrook, he had told me, this is a story, I don't know if it's true, I can't verify it, but he was in the RLI, and he was a guy who tracked down Andre Rabi when, when Andre was killed in a blue, blue and blue incident. Now, and he said after that, the SAS made life help him because, you know, he said he didn't even shoot, he, you know, it was one of his flankers who actually saw these guys in the, in the dam, and, and Andre was still like down in the riverbed tracking. And he said the saddest thing was that when he was a tracker, when he was being taught tracking, Andre said to him, CJ, that they are anti track and you can track me, I'll buy your case of beers. And CJ was now, now this guy, I'll tell you what, he could track. And, he could, and Shona, fluent Shona speaker, he used to, he actually used to correct the black soldiers' uh, language. And these guys, the one guy even said to me, he said, You close your eyes and that man is talking. That, that's not a white man talking, that's a black man talking. And when we did this, when we did this follow up, we came to an area. Now we were tracking one, one, one tour. And let me tell you, Tony, you, you just try and track one person. And we came to a rocky, really rocky area. And CJ said, Corporal Mac, you come right up my ass because you're my eyes and ears. Now I'm sitting down looking down and you, you just, you just look for shit. And he sat there and he said, in Afrikaans, I'm a very tired guy. I'm going to echo Where will I go? Where will I? And he just, and, and he just went, well, I'm going to stand over here. Then I'm going to stand over here. He went. We must have got about 800 meters to, to, to about a kilometer, just over rocks. Nothing to show, no no spoor, nothing at all. We came out on a dirt path and there was a spoor right there where CJ came out. That's that's amazing. that's how the track he was. He was an amazing, amazing track. 
And also the other other two other two instances we had, um, I don't think I don't think the two were related. If we if we came to within five kilometers of our common border, uh, our boundary, um, we had to let Jock know. So we we, we were going to ambush. I think we were going we were going to be about a, a, about a kilometer or so into the TTL, and the farmlands was um, was um, support unit support unit cops were there. So we got we got dropped off on on, on the road probably about seven o'clock at night. And we only had about three k's to walk through through the farmlands. We had to go through the farmlands. There was like there was a, there was a path going like this, and there was and there, there was another path coming along that joined them just just before the TTL. And Tony, I found a beautiful ambush site, absolutely beautiful ambush site. There was a, there was an old gnarled tree uh, over this like there was a dip. So we all lay inside the dip. It was a moonlit night. I could put, I could put my claymore out there because because there's like a bank that, that would have protected us. And the cops, the support unit came and they laid an ambush in the in the um, in the farmlands, all about a, about maybe 800 meters away from, from the TTL. And these and these tourists came came walking along in that path. And what happened was that the the, the I don't know what the well, he wouldn't be a constable, the, the the officer in charge. He had a 32 Zulu on the end of his weapon, and he knows that it takes X amount of, of, of meters to to, mm. to ignite. Yeah. And yet the whole group got past, and then and then he fired, and then they opened up. So that, so that he, but now we're sitting in an ambush position and watching all this red trace coming through, coming through the trees. And I'm going, like, oh. so I mean, I knew it was our guys. I thought, what the hell is going on over here? So that was that. We just about got got taken out, and, and and I said there was no notification that they were, that they were within five five k's of a of a common boundary. Another case. Now also, we we had an SP guy there. Very, very. I, I don't remember his name. Maybe Mike Norton will remember his name. But it was a very strict SP guy. And we had we had this um, farm. The farmhouse was attacked, and the two kids were there. I, I, I'm not I'm not sure that this is now uh, Udzi Udzi area. I'm not sure if the if the um, if the folks were in Amtali or they'd gone through to 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 Sorry or whatever it was. And these two youngsters were about seventeen and fifteen. So they're sitting there and they get and they, and they get drift. So they fight off the fight off the, the tours to God. So next morning we we came down with SP to see how these guys were. There, there were these two youngsters standing there, uh, black black shorts, sh you know, like I'm saying youngsters, FNs, chest webbing. And I see the one guy, the the, the youngest guy, the 15 year old, he's got this bruise. And I said to him, "Was that? Yeah? Did you guys get hit with an RPG?" So he said, "No, no, no." He said, "Yeah, what happens?" At, Books opened up in us. So the first thing we did is that we killed, we killed the, the lights. You know, they got the generator and they have, they have an old decompressor. They just pull the chain and just kill the, kills the generator. And the weapons were inside, were inside the, the bedroom, the bedroom cupboard. So now this guy's running now into his bedroom. Pitch dark, of course, no lights. And the and the bedroom and the and the and the cupboard door was open. <laughs> he ran into the cupboard door. There was that energy and these two youngsters, I couldn't believe it. they were like so so blase about about fighting off these 15 right. turns. You know? Amazing, because uh, your nerves go crazy when that happens, doesn't it? And um, I think that happened about oh, at least four or five uh, major incidents where um, uh, farmers' wives and their kids fought off attacks. And I would really, yeah. I would really, really love to to interview those people. Um, if anybody could ever come forward in that line, it would be lovely to interview them. Yeah, carry on, Mac. Yeah, and, and 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 that's where I agree with you. Because if you think about some of those farm and wives, now their husbands are where I'm <laughs> The tours are still there. And now they, they think, well, she's an easy target. Or like the kids are an easy target, you know what I mean? And sometimes, I mean, those guys would come along in the middle of the day. Why? Because there was one farmer there with a gap. Yeah. There were 13 of them. What were his, his ones? But anyway, so now, <laughs> so so the other the other thing, I, actually, the, the, one, the one sad thing we had was that because we were we were like right on the border. It was an old disused farm. I remember that because it was tobacco barns where we, the cars were based. In. And we walked out from our from our camp that night. And I had a, I had a, I had a guy with me, a very good friend of mine, Gavin Mordsy. He had, he, he had the brain gun. Almost three. Walking along. Now there's a full curfew on because this is early 77. And we stopped for smoke break, breather type of thing, just to listen in. And then coming towards us, it's pitch dark. And it was actually two little kids, and the guy, the guy started shooting at me with a cat. I could hear these stones go flying past me. So, so Gavin said, Hey, you were. You know, and they took off. So I just, I just tapped him on, because he was lying around. I just tapped him, and he, and he opened up in the bingo. And he shot this one this one little kid. And he was he was absolutely devastated because now he's he's got he's got two children of his own. And like, 
you know, so anyway, the next morning, SP came because, of course, we just, uh, we couldn't carry on what we were going to do. We'd be out of weight. We didn't even know what we were shot. We didn't even know if we'd even shot anybody at all. So Gavin, Gavin was absolutely distraught and uh, SP came down and, you know, rid of the body and he had a message on, and he was carrying a message from one, from one group group to another group group wow. to, organize, to organize a meeting. So to a certain extent, it made it feel a bit better, but you know, you still, you still don't feel, still don't feel comfortable about, about shooting rifles. Terrible. And and then l- later on that camp, Gavin actually, because um, he was a surveyor, and they actually called him away because they wanted to use him to to survey for the keeps, uh, for the for the perimeter fences. So that was that was the last that was the last I saw, I saw, I saw Gavin, and he'd even been in in uh, in first back with me as well, and the, and the other well, it's funny now. The other instance we had, as I said, our major was he was a really good major, our Lindsay Treadwell. And we, we, you know, we would do all stupid things, like even when we were in the Honda, the, the trucks would drive right up to, to, um, to Malsetta and we'd go, and we'd go into, into Stableford Forest and then walk down from there. So the guys had no idea where we were coming from, where we were going, whatever. Same story. You would, you would drive the, you would drive the trucks up. We would, we would jump off on the move at night and then, and then the trucks would go into, into Nyanga and they would go, Go and spend the night there. Uh, yeah. What what unit was that in the back? That was eight bat. That was eight bat. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I was an eight bat from from seventy six um, um, about September seventy six onwards. And so now th- this night he, he tells us, go down. You, you got two trucks. Go down to the go down to the Uzi Hotel. Sit there, have a have a few beers because about nine o'clock about nine o'clock pull out and and go and go and do you know. Trucks will take you to position and you, and you can walk off. And so now, as we're driving out, of course, all the weapons have been cleared because we could get the boots out. We've got our two IC in the truck with us on Gordon Guthrie. And I didn't have a machine gunner mask, so, so the machine gunner had, it, had his weapon on the, on the, on the four or five on the side with, you know, with, the, with the bipods on the side. And as he cocked it, of course, he didn't pull the working parts all the way to the rear. So as he let the working parts go, it fired around up straight through the boot of this of this Peugeot four hundred four. Shit! So now now we're shooting ourselves because we're not AD and and and, and our Gordon Guthrie's head comes out of the turret. He says, "Did you hit anybody?" He said, "No, sir." He says, "Fine, let's just fuck off. <laughs> we just drive away." And so some guy's got a bloody seven sixty bullet hole through the boot of his bloody Peugeot. <laughs> uh, and also, yeah. Tony, that that was the one and only time an eighth batter operated with a loot. And this car was a this car was a ninety day wonder. He was one of those guys that they'd gone to Osby's and in three months they pushed them through. And you know, I operated, I did one, one like I went out to them at night once and I came back to the major and I said, No, look, I'm not operating with this guy. I mean, the guy, the guy's trying to walk through the bush on a, on a, on a compass berry. I said to him, You know, you're going to be walking through all this grass, leaving tracks, and all the locals are going to say, Well, there's a path here. Why is this guy walking at an angle all the way through the bush? I said, Then when you come to a river, there ain't no crossing there. So then you've got to find your way to to wherever the crossing is. You know what I mean? And plus as well, because we had, you know, we had skin dark, he used nugget boot polish. Now you know that shines. It's it's I mean it's like a bloody headlight. You know, the moon shining. <laughs> I said no no no. So I just said I just said to the major. Well, when he was like captain, I said I said so I'm not going to operate this car. So I just just leave you be. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, so Lindsay was very, very good because in that contact that I was telling you about when we had those, when we had that, when I shot those four guys, when I got back to, when I ran back to the road after the guys had been uh, uh, firing uh, uh, rifle grenades at us, um, there were two guys from the other stick. Now, these guys had previously, they were, they were, they were English guys, they were pommy guys. They said, ah, when we meet the thirds, we'll rip them apart with our bands and they're all these big, you know, uh, gym bunnies. And, um, when I ran back, when Ben, when when Ben and I ran back, these guys told me they were sitting in this like ditch, but they were looking down. They were looking down like this. I mean, they, I could come along and shot both of them, and then said, "It, it, it was it was the Thursday that shot them." So afterwards, you know, when we were back at base, and as I was saying, we were having our beers, and John Dale Robinson telling me about the Lord look after that, and I just went to the major, and I just said to the major, "Listen, I don't, I don't, I don't even want to operate anywhere near those two guys again because I thought to myself, if I can't rely on them." And you know what? To show the, the measure of a man that Lindsay Chetel was, he didn't say why Mac. He just said fine. Didn't ask any questions. Because you know, Tony, this is the one thing that that that, that I can. I was worried about myself as it would I? When it came to action, would I freeze? You know, and I mean, you're in charge of guys. Would I do something stupid? Would I get guys killed? But I, okay, I agree. With you. you know, you have to be in action before you realize. But 
the thing is that when, when you do get into action, you want to know that that you that, that, that you've got people behind you that are thinking the same way as you. Know, you know, it's no good luck. Right. Like saying, let's go, guys. And, yeah. and everybody everybody else just sits there. You go running off on your, on your top looking like a bloody yeah. idiot. Then, Absolutely. Then you wonder why you're drawing all the fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, from, from that point of view, but I mean, the other thing I was telling you about, about CJ, I mean, besides being a phenomenal track and a phenomenal, phenomenal um, uh, Shona speaker, we had this big talk before we went in, the guys who explained to us how much the war was costing. Now, this is, Tony, this is at the time we had a 10% increase in our tax to pay for the war. So we were paying for ourselves to go. And the guy was saying, like, it's 30 cents for every round that you fire. It's like eight bucks for every round for grenade. And I remember it was $10,000 for a hunter strike. And, and a helicopter was $147 an hour for, for fuel. So anyway, so now, so now, as I was saying, what the major wanted to do, he, he, would, he would always send the, uh, like the tracker stick in, uh, normally not in the stock group, in a, in a stock group, and then they could track right from the, right from the worker. So they, they next to us and, 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 and uh, Scene's going on. So CJ puts a rifle grenade on his and he goes, Bow! He says, That's eight bucks back on my tax. Puts another rifle grenade. You know, <laughs> that's, six, that's 16 bucks back on my tax. <laughs> he, was, he was getting all his money. He was getting his money <laughs> for the, the tax increase. But Tony, we had, we, we, we had a scene with him as well. Um, we, uh, you see, th this is where I'm starting to get the, the, the dates in terms of the next day. In the beginning, when we went into the Hondi, we stayed at the, at the, at the keep. The, um, Internal affairs keep the the road went through to, to Pungui Bridge and onto Aberfoyle and that, and the, the 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 police camp was on one side, and the keep was, was was quite far off the road, and there was there was no PB at that stage. It was just the keep. I think for about three or four camps there was there was there was no there was no there was no PB. So we could task guys that we, we're going to move all these people into into the keep. As I say, I have no idea. This was seventy eight or I don't I don't even remember, and. We we came down from Stapleford Forest there. We, we actually ride right, because we knew the Helen gone. We were just about on the Mozambique border actually. And the trick was that uh, that the tracking stick would lead us in, and we, there was about there was about three three other sticks. And what happened is that we'd we'd get to the uh, we'd get to the the, the first place, and, and the guy straight behind the tracking stick, the track is the CJ would say, "Okay, this is this is where you've got to go." And we were set to go to go for two, at twelve o'clock at night. So everyone was going to be in position for twelve o'clock, and we'd start to round up all the locals, talk to the other guys, and then and then there was, it was just it was just my stick. And what happened? We were walking on. It was a bit of like a like a a dirt road, but it was more of like like we we're Scotch cart So we like just like two real cars, if you know. I mean, I mean I suppose you could drive a Land Rover down there, but I mean it wasn't it wasn't like a graded road. Like, and the path that he that he led the other guys onto, because now we were the last, we were the last stick, and then, and then, and then the tracking stick was they going to carry on to, to, to that place. They took these guys down that left place. That was middle of winter, it was July, and CJ was wearing a grey coat, and he went down went down the path of the four, four guys and them off. So so I'm standing there, happy as can be, blackened up as as well, and these guys come walking towards us, and they're also walking in staggered file. It was a tour. Well, about ten tours, and he had a grey coat on as well. And he had, this, I think, I can't remember, it's a thousand round or seven fifty that, that that box that their stuff used to come in. And he was carrying it over his shoulder, but he also had a grey coat on as well. And and he, his, his AK was pointing downwards. And he came up to me and he said to me, "Indian, who are you?" And Tony, I was just about to say, "CJ, that's not funny." And I just pissed off. I don't think that's very funny. Oh, oh. And 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 like like I said to you, and everything was like, I mean, Tony, this guy, I could. If I leaned forward, I could have, I could have virtually touched him. And I had, I had, I had my effort on my, on, on my thing like this. And just suddenly, I just saw this curved magazine. I was AK, and I realized. And I mean, I just, oh. I just, I, I, I think my first, my first two rounds hit the guy in the shin and the knee. And, and what a shock to the system! He, he still managed to get, he still managed to get off nineteen rounds from his AK. He grabbed his AK and he just, he, thank God, it just went into the ground again. And I, and I just, and as he was pulling back, and I, and I also hit the guy behind him. And now, meanwhile, the tracking stick is coming back up on their on their path, and they just see all this one tracer going flying over there. So they don't know what the bloody hell going on. And uh, and anyway, the, the, the next morning, um, when when uh, when SP came out, we found on the on the fence line a chunk of meat. Some guy just run through a barbed wire fence, left left behind a bit of his thighs. And like, <laughs> like I say, we we reckon they just gapped it back into back into Mozambique. So, so because because of that, we we we, we also had a situation whereby. We, we were walking in at night, tours bumped into us, and it was, you know, and 
should be just opened up. Nobody hit anybody. But anyway, so, so that was this whole thing. Where, you know, you, you go and look at the citrus and it says a mutual contact. Okay, say mutual. Nothing bloody mutual about that. You know, so that was, if they didn't ambush you, or if you hadn't ambushed them, or if you hadn't initiated the contact, it was considered to be a mutual contact. So what happened, Tony, is that after, after that, especially now with this business with, 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 this, with this term, I started uh, a protocol. It's, it's very long. It's, it takes, it'll take time to explain it, which based on whistles and clicks, because you know, we, we were now meeting up with our own guys all the time. And the third so-called mutual contact, we had same story. Guys were coming along, and our guys were meant to be coming on the road, and what they were after. So these guys coming towards us. We, we went, they pushed, and I went through the protocols, and the guy, on the second protocol, he just kept on coming, and I just thought, oh, I just thought to myself, please, don't let it be our guys. Because I'd, I'd say to the guys, this is what we're going to do when we meet up at night. And they opened up, and sure as not, it, it was it, it was turned. So, so called, that's another mutual contact. And the same story, the guys are watching them and watching all this bed tracer coming flying over there because they were, they, they, they were only about, about um, 200, 300 meters away from us. You know what I mean? So, um, so, so you, you know, from that point of view, is that you, you, you know, you, you have so many, I think your experiences, it, it, it was, everything was based on experience. In other words, you, you worked out what worked, what didn't work. And I mean, I remember we did it. We did a battle camp, and Brian, Brian Murphy, the Indonesian rugby captain, he was, he was, he was going about, ah, you know, uh, the Turks can smell the toothpaste, and they can smell the soap and everything. Like that. And I just turned around, I said, Brian, man, bullshit. I said, you know, how many times that, that I mean, as I'm saying, we used to be out for six days, six days, six nights, and we'd come back for one night. And the number of times we had seen the first day we were out, or, or, or that night when we were going out, so, so we were all clean and smelling, and so I put down, man, you know, if the Turks don't know you're there. That's where that, you know, that's that's how it sort of boils down to. But um, you know, I tell you, like when you when you asked me towards the end of my first talk about, about PTSD, and I had the situation where I did have nightmares after that when I had that contact with those two those two guys at, at 10, ten yards. And but I mean, very very weird. I mean, I mean, I said nightmares. I used, to, I, used to, I used to I used to see these bullets coming towards me like in slow motion. I could see them doom doom doom. And I remember I could hear these guys and they were laughing, but everything was like, was like, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And then this bullet would hit me in the chest and I would, I would wake up and I'd be like holding my breath. And, like, oh. and you know, so the wife said to me, oh, well, if this is what the army is doing to you, I think you better ask for an exemption. Mm. So that was very, but the, the, the weirdest thing was that when I was in the bush, I never had those, I never had those parties. I only had them back in service street. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You know I mean? yeah. But now, you know, to, talking about shock, after that, that very first when we got ambushed down in the valley, and I was working for Standard Bank, and I was I was a, I was a teller. I was I was serving a client in a car back part in the parking lot. I just mm-hmm. hit the ground. Mm-hmm. She was going, "Okay, uh, Mr. Yeah. McKenzie." And I said, "No, oh, no, sorry, I've, I've dropped something here. I've dropped something yeah. here." Yeah, it was a deep freeze lid for me, slamming shut. Yeah, <laughs> and then and then in January, sitting here, we put out a cake down, and my, my wife and I we went by train, and our friends had parked on on on, on top of um, the station. And, and and we were coming on to get in the car, and they fired that noonday gun. Mm. And Tony, I just I hit the deck. Eh? I tell mm. you, I took all the skin off like, my knees and my hands, mm. and I'm I'm standing there now, and like everyone else is carrying on, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm like suddenly I realised, oh, hang on, I'm just, yeah. And everyone went Mac, Mac, and I'm going, shit, have you seen the mags on this Porsche over here? Thank God, I, I ducked down next to a Porsche. But I mean, I just I just hit the tarmac. Yeah, that's, I, that was. I don't think there's. So as you say, that's. You know, you know, you know, there's nothing more frightening, I think, than. Bumping into somebody at such close quarters, um, especially in the, the darkening hours of the day where you can't make out the features. Um, I never personally experienced that, but I, I think I, I I would have, you know, gone where you went with your PTSD on that one. Um, I've, I saw a movie once where uh, the Americans were ambushing these tours in Vietnam somewhere, and they were just walking slowly through these tours, and they actually initiated the contact against the guys ambushing them and um i I think that must be horrific you know uh i certainly wouldn't like to have experienced that and Um, and tony the other thing um that you know in relation to ptsd i mean i suppose in a certain way it it, it did make you a bit more aggressive you know you're a bit like more short-tempered than that at this stage i was working i was working for 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 roback and uh, you know once again i mean from from early '77, it was just it really was a busy time, and you know, I was involved in so many things. That and a guy came in from from Norton to to cash a check, and, I, and I'd, I'd given the approval to the teller. <clears throat> End of the day, I got called in by the assistant manager because I hadn't charged the guy twenty five cents country check commission. 
And I said to him, look, uh, Mr. Brown, I'm very sorry, but yeah, I just reached in my pocket. I said, well, there's the 25 cents. And he said, oh, no, 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 that's not the, that's not the point. The whole point is, and I tell you, I just exploded. Eh? I just think, I reckon if I had a gun, I would have shot the guy. I had a knife, I would have stabbed him to death. I would just, and I just said to him, you know, I said, I'm making life and death decisions and you fucking pistol, pistol for 25 bloody cents. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and you know, I mean, okay, maybe maybe it was the right thing to do because suddenly there was, there was very few people that I worked with who were actually like an in infantry. All these guys were in stores or they were in new serum or they were, operated the bloody computer for call-ups. So they all had cushy jobs, you know what I mean? And so there wasn't even anybody I could relate to in the bank. And then the other thing, of course, that was happening, which I suppose it made sense to the bank, because you were spending so much time in the bush, all the women got promotion. So people that four years before that you taught them the job, they, were, they now suddenly became your boss. Because, of course, women in the bank could pay less than men. So the bank scored it. The bank scored in two on, on, on yeah. two stages. So, <clears throat> so mm -hmm. what happened, Tony, in, 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 in 78, 78, I had to have a, an operation for dislocated shoulder. Um, I dislocated it playing rugby. But that was the first time. But I just got it three times in the space of, of, of a six-week call-up. And that re that's what did all the damage. Um, we, we, we were going into the Hondi, and my, I had to blow off my head. So the guy stopped the truck, and we, we had the ammo trailer behind us. And as I was climbing back up in the back of the four park, somebody said to the driver, yeah, go. I still wasn't over the tailgate. And this truck took off. And all I thought was, said, there's a bloody ammo trailer behind me. And I grabbed hold of the tailgate. And I heard, you know, like tearing material. I heard. Oh. And I... I spun around completely. I mean, I can't, I can't even, I can't even do it. I was just hanging because I knew, even though my arm was dislocated, I knew. And my mate just saw my knuckles going white, so he grabbed me by my dislocated arm and pulled me onto the truck. Oh, wow, that's painful. Then I dislocated it in a contact, taking, taking cover, I mean, they were going down on your left shoulder and bloody dislocated. And, and I dislocated it on a trampoline. <laughs> we were, we were at, uh, Protein original, I said to the guys, watch this, let me show you this trick and hold it. I was like, what type of trick? I said, oh, I'm a bloody <laughs> <laughs> one. So, anyway, so, so, so I had to have an offer for that. And then I was, I was, um, I was unfit for all, all, all military duties for three months. And when I came back, B Company were already, you know, my normal company, they were, they, they were already in the bush. So I, went, so I went to this other company, D Company, or I don't know, and nobody knew me. I'm the only guy there with long hair and a beard. So the, these guys don't know me. So, um, we had, we had trackers. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. We we go we're driving and we're driving past like say Marin Dallas because we ended up at like Cotwa and Malseta. That area. so we're driving we're, we're driving along and, and and I just looked at the guys watching the side of me. I thought it was eleven nineteen minutes past eleven. <clears throat> so the guy on the side of me, a guy called Tony Brown, he nudges me. He says, "Excuse me, I'm you know what time it is." So I said, "Look, I haven't got a watch." And I just looked up at the sun. I said, "It's about nineteen minutes past eleven, You see, so. You know, if I'd said, like, oh, it's about 11 o'clock or half past 11, but because it's 19 minutes. So he nudges the guy next to him and says, like, like, what's the time of the guy? So it's 19 minutes past 11. <laughs> At the end of the camp, the end of the camp, this guy, he, he said to me, you know, Mac, I, I, was, I was so impressed with you. You know, there you are with your beard and everything long hair. You could just look up at the sun. You could tell the time right at the minute. So I said to him, Tony, I said, I, I saw the guys, you know, the time of his watch. He said, you know, for six weeks, I've been telling everyone, don't mess with that guy. Don't mess with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> real good. Excellent. And what happened? I mean, to me, this is so funny because we had shotgun truckers, but the, the, the guy in charge of them was a guy called Sparrow. I think it was Mike Sparrow. And you know, and you know what the call sign is for truckers, the Sparrows. I mean, and, and the shotgun truckers, they, they were all right. We, we had a well, we had two 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 big scenes. Of it. The one, the one our guys also moving into position. We we were up at we were up at I think it was like a like a like a police uh, uh, recreational camp. We were up on this buddy, up in this high flat plateau and that, and, and these proper little houses built and stuff like that. And anyway, our guys had bumped into guys coming across the coming across the border. Also about also about eighty strong. So we we drove down with the, with the trackers and 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 some backups to come we tracked them. Same story. I mean. At that stage, I hadn't gone to recce, so I didn't really know much about tracking. But I mean, I've been with CJ a lot of times, and I mean, you know, you could you, you could track by braille. That's a, that, that's a big one. Anyway, we walked about fifty. We walked about fifteen k's, huh? and 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 they they ran back to the border, and then we had to walk the fifteen k's back to, to get the truck. So we only, we only got picked up about about eight nine o'clock at night because it was probably we got back and we were knackered. And uh, and then I remember we did 
that was that one. We, we did another one and we, and we were tracking. And I was the only white guy because the, the other two follow up sticks were, were all, all black soldiers. I said, and I said, this is now towards the end of 78. And these black soldiers, because I, because they kept the wanting to stop for a smack back when I said, no, man, we, we got, we got spoiled, we got spoiled. And we had this one tracker, I'll, 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 Smart, he's Smarty, he was my, he was my lead tracker. Patson was the other one. And Smarty only spoke Shangan. I didn't speak Shangan. And, and he didn't speak Shona. And the two of us, he'd be going away in Shangan. I'd be talking to him in Shona in English and Afrikaans and running a launch and up a lap and everything. And all the other trackers would just piss themselves laughing because the two of us, we knew, we knew what we were talking about. But anyway, <laughs> and so anyway, these guys that came to Smart and they said to Smart, hey, listen, tell, tell the white guy that you lost tracks. And Smart said, no, man, you don't understand. This, this guy, he's actually doing the tracking. Now, this guy can really track you. He, he, he and the, the black guy said to him, so let, he said, if, if we had contact, he says, just watch your back. So I thought, shit, man. But anyway, the, the, the story came out later on. So what happened was that, um, so I, I I, I said to my trackers, I said, let us men carry on and we'll and we'll leave these women behind to some drink tea and, and talk. And, and off we went. So, so, so that night we were back at base camp because you know, eventually the locals had driven um, um, cattle over the uh, over the over the spoor, so we uh, so we lost tracks. The trackers came to me and they all bought me beers. I said, No, what's this for? And they said, No, this is thank you because you you realize that we are men and they those guys aren't. Anyway. The black troops were on mutiny. They refused to guard. They brought in, they brought in some high powered guy. We, we were just saying, let's pick the whole lot and change, send them off to bloody detention banks, but it never happened. And Tony, I said to myself, I'm not going to operate like this. You know, I'm not going to operate because, because that's what Smart said to me that the guy said. Just we, we had a youngster, he would translate, he would translate for Smart. I'm sure it was a really nice good tracker. And, uh, and, he, and he told me the story. And then I said, no, I don't want to operate like this. Uh, we, we 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 had another scene. We got dropped off. That major, he was an idiot. Man. He was, I, I know his name, but I won't mention it. He was a Rhodesian chess chess champion. But he had, he had you know, after operating with Lindsay Tudgold, who was a man manager. I mean, Lindsay, the one time, it's pissing down. It's been dragged. We got hit with the cycle in, in the in the hunting. So he calls up. He says, "Okay, guys, get back to base. We've got to, we've got a truck stop pick up. We've, we've got a sighting here. We're going to go and do a scene." So we come. We walk and rush in. We said, "Fine. Where's the sighting? Where's the sighting?" He says, what's the point of you guys being out there? You're on OP. He says, you're going to see nothing because half the time the clouds are lower than your OP position. It's pissing down with rain. He said, all the tours are sitting in, in huts and they're all dry. You guys are just getting wet and getting pissed off. And we sat for three days back at, back at the keep and he was sending out reports that we hear there and everywhere we weren't. Now, that was the type of guy that, you know what I mean? Yeah. He was, yeah. A, Tony, he was the type of guy that if you said to me, tie a four or five on your back and climb up big falls, I would do it because it, there would have been a reason why they needed that four or five. On. Yeah. He was somebody that cared for you guys. You know what I mean? He was just a phenomenal yeah. major. Really. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He really, really cared for us. And, uh, and this, this, this standard bank manager, this, this chess champion. I mean, we, we had a scene where we into Staplefoot Forest and we, we, we believed that, that the, um, the, the workforce were, were feeding the turns. So they like, they were in a compound behind them. So all these guys had to be in position, you know, all these stop groups and then, and then, and then, we would come and the tracking stick would come in and we would, if anything happened. And the one stick, um, they took a wrong, you know, I mean, you, you're walking at night and you suddenly you come to a junction and there's like four, there's four roads going off at tangents. You know what I mean? now, now, all you've got to do is, is take the third one instead of taking the fourth one and you, and you ain't going to be in position. So unfortunately, what these, these guys said, look, we, we're not in position. So anyway, we, we, we got there. I did a 360 round. And I said, no, there's absolutely nothing here. There's been no, because the gate was still locked. I said, there's, there's, nobody's come through the, 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 the fence, anything like that. So then he told these guys, you guys will walk back to, you guys will walk back to your base. And I mean, you know, from Stamperford, we had to get right down. The shortest route was right down over this bay, ravine, this, this river, and come back up on the other side. So I let, I let, I let all the other trucks go because I was driving. I said to my trucking, I said to my stick, you guys, you shut up, you don't say a word, huh? Don't say a word. I said, Davey, get on, get on this, get on my truck now. I said, I'll take you to Jess, about 800 meters below the camp. I said, and sit down there by the river for about an hour or two. I said, <clears throat> you know, then I suggest you really, you really balaka, you know, you like, you just run up there. So when you get up there, you'll be all hot and sweaty. You know? And we, we, when they got back, the man said, yeah, did I teach you a lesson? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Stop that. You don't yeah. treat people, you don't treat yeah. people like that. But, 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 but the one thing that we had was that, 
we, we we went to do a big a big sweep through. So we so we we were part of the we were part of the sweep, and it, it was a, you know, during the day, and then it was and there was we were sweeping through milly fields and and cars and everything like that. And we saw we saw the turns up ahead of us. I was standing there with the RPD every shoulder, up, up and checking us, checking us. So the whole time these guys are going north, these guys are going north, and we've got about about, about twenty guys with us, and there's about about five sticks. So we're tracking, and then of course every time these guys do the dog legs, I told I, I told I told the guys, I told the, the, the follow up trips, just stay away from us, just give us about hundred meters, please, because you know, these guys do a, a dog leg, and then suddenly by the time we're following the spoor, you guys are walking over the spoor. So just 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 near my just near my stick. So we go, and these guys all of a sudden eight in the afternoon they head off head off west. So I said I said to the trackers I said to the guys I said you're smart smart we're going to get rid of this now. He said no 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 these 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 trucks these guys are about an hour ahead of us. <clears throat> Trust me we're going to get rid. <clears throat> and we were sweeping through like a like an upland flay type of thing. It was very, very boggy, and there was a, there was a copy in front of us. The, the gooks were sitting in the copy. So, so now I'm going, I'm totally, I'm totally blacked up. But you know, a white guy walks definitely to, to, to a black guy. And as we hit the shadow of the copy, because now the sun is, the sun city, so we're looking straight into the sun. These guys are open up in us. And I'm just watching, I can just see all this green traffic going over my head. Every, every single gook was shooting at me. And the guy found an RPG and it landed, it landed about five, five, ten yards in front of me. And because the ground was so soft, and it, look, I mean, it blew me off my feet, it took, it took me off my feet. And then I learned a, a new a new firing position, which is called leopard crawling backwards while you while you're firing while you're firing <laughs> like this, and your dick and your dick is trying to dig your slip trench while you're back while you came backwards as well. Yeah. And then of course what happened is that the, the rest of the group who were still walking, they pushed back, they came to the edge of the flame, they just opened up. That was that was the end of the end of the contact. That was that was that. So. So then I thought, and then, and then I, I can't remember where I heard, but I heard that 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 we're going to do a Ricky course. We're going to do a Ricky course with with uh, fourth bat guys, fourth bat trackers, and we went out off to that. That would have been about October, November, so just before Christmas. No, no, it wouldn't. It would have been later. It would have probably been November to December. Yeah, that's right. And we had we had Joe Holmes, who was in the, I think Army uh, of Rhodesia episode ninety one, and 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 Captain uh, Jungle Jordan. He was, I think, 103, I think, said 103. And I think Jungle, he was, well, because because it was being run by Laurie Ryan, so I'd imagine Laurie Ryan, of course, but it was Laurie Ryan, Joe Holmes, Wes Hall, Callum Forsyth, um, uh, Johnny Smith, those were guys who really ran the course. Jungle, I think he, he, he'd he done um, SA selection, and they were moving like a scotch cart or something, and I think he'd, he'd injured his finger, like, and, and so he couldn't finish the course. I think he was, he was just... He was just with us just to just to keep up his uh, keep up his fitness and and, and to pass the bit of stuff that they did. And that, that was really interesting. I'll tell you what, though, you know, we spent we spent our last week at 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 uh, at, uh, at Andre Robbie Barracks with Sully Scouts. <laughs> it was quite embarrassing. Our sergeant, I won't mention his full name. We just know Sergeant Zingi Zingi tall, tall guy, and he he taught us ten different ways how to anti track across the road. And everything that I thought. Was anti tracking was actually making it easier to do. <laughs> so, so we learned, we learned, we learned, we learned a hell of a lot. We, the guy showed us the dogs, the the, the fox hounds. We ran, three of us ran for, for half an hour. The dogs found us in, dogs found us in 10 minutes. So, so that just goes to, you know, and I mean, we, we trotted, yeah. we, we can. Yeah. And, uh, and it was, uh, we, we did a Dems course with Charlie Small. Uh, what a nice guy, super guy. And and what and what also um, oh, Tim Feller yeah Tim Feller I, I knew I knew from he was at Fort Vic and uh, and he played lock or, or I was I was a centre for Jamison but I remember Tim Keller and when we saw him he was all he was all twitched and everything like that and it it wasn't I don't think I'd spoken to Ronry I, 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 I remember I mean we had a chat with Ronry Daly and he was so nice it was so amazing when you go there you you got breakfast on a on a proper plate and the guy says to you how many sausages do you want how many eggs like, oh. oh, what? <laughs> what a pleasure hey? you yeah. couldn't believe this yeah. and uh, and he, somebody said to me they were obviously a regular series cut he actually said that that fellow and his last five ops had been hot had been hot extracted that amazing big so I, I, I don't know how those guys did that I honestly I don't, don't. I take my hat off to them I mean you know some of them being the only white guy in and a group of 10 or 12 turns uh, lying in a bush somewhere. 
That is I, amazing. That is, that I, is amazing. You know, I, I, I don't know what their PTSD was like afterwards, but um, horrific, I should think. I should. I, I, that's what I was thinking. You know what I mean? You know, you know what I did find, Tony, was that because I, I did once do a, 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 a two-man two man OP. That was when I was back with back with B Company HR. And what happened was that he realized how difficult it is to actually actually find one guy or two guys. So so it, in the beginning, I was like, nah, man, you bloody man. Jeez, you know, if we run into it. That's the thing is that you're not there to run into shit. You're there to actually avoid it. You know what I mean? So so from that side. And uh, that, 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 was such an that was such an excellent course. It really was. So we were we were always in the keep at the Honda, and they they opened up on these on these um, two little kids. Um, it was it was actually outside of their zone on that angle, and I'm on the blow, and I'm going stop three stop 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 stop. They're still firing. I tell you, I tell you what. Oh, actually, I've got goose. I and just all these kids, you know, just all this dust kicking up, and these kids they're running this way, they're running that way. So eventually, I, I turned and I shot, I shot into the trees above these guys' head. It was the only way I could get, I could get there. So anyway, so now. I'm I'm already in the shit now because my one guy one guy must have come back pissed now because as I said I didn't want to use my one my one bank because in case somebody did get injured. And we now down at the police police cap having 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 a few beers. And there's one guy from Stockley. I know his name, but I won't mention it. And he's like telling the cops, oh yeah, it is this that. So I said, uh, so what do you want? You want a bloody GCV for for shooting at kids? So instead of saying to me, look, Mac, it's an honest mistake. It was a thick push, we just saw movement and we found this guy trying to come out of this. And Tony, I just, I just, I just dropped, it, just smacked him. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we got back to when we got back to base camp. Oh boy, did the major shit me out there! Mm -hmm. Because like he said, like and I, he didn't want to hear my excuse. So he didn't want to hear that I said. But you know, I, I'm also beginning to think now as well. Was, was that a bit of my bloody PTSD as well? That, mm -hmm. that you know, just that, that my fuse was like that long. You know what I mean? It was like non-existent. Yeah, there's no doubt that uh, people's tempers tempers were shortened tremendously. Um... You know, uh, your nerves are on edge, and that's all there was to it. Um, you know, particularly as territorials, we were in the bush for six weeks out. Um, the swing between being a guy in your city street job uh, with all the feelings and emotions that you've carried from the bush, and often the only way to unwind was to either fight somebody or get pissed or shout yeah. at your wife or throw something around. And... Um, then you're sitting there for six weeks waiting for that that bloody brown envelope to come through the post box. Yeah. Um, it it was a terrible sort of um, push pull feeling on our emotions, and I can well understand guys, uh, you know, let, letting things fly in, in that time back in City Street, you know, and where where the time spent with kids were denied because Dad was at the pub, yeah. drowning his sorrows, and the kids could have been playing cricket with you or something in the garden. Yeah, it it um, it was a different feeling that many of us experienced, different from the regulars. You know, I think they oh. they were so immersed in the the day to day in, in war. Um, you know, obviously they had their own tensions and they let it out the cock door and other places. But uh, you know, we had our own as well. Yeah, because the other thing, and the, the one I really got pissed with, there was a letter in the in the Herald saying about uh, I think it was after Natasha Glendening had been had been killed. They were all saying, oh, yeah, as long as it's white, white kids, you know, and, and you people don't care about the blacks and the locals and that type of thing. And we we, we were coming back now. As I said, we, we used to spend six nights out, one night back at base. And, and as I said, we used to take six six tins with us. That was for, for, for the six nights. You know? And we would come back and just, I mean, um, I, I can pinpoint the place on the on Google Maps, just below um, Hooters Runway. So we were driving back. Tracking stick, they, I don't know, they, they, they walked out because trackers were there. And we saw this, that smoldering at the side, side of the road. So CJ, whoa, whoa, stop the truck, stop the truck. So he gets up and he goes up. And as I said, he could speak, brilliant, Shana. There had been six locals, three guys and three three women. And all that happened was that their husbands, these three guys, were land agriculture officers. So they taught the guys how to plow, don't plow down, you, plow, you do contour, contour plowing and that type of thing. And that was the that was the only crime. So, so because it was so close to Rudy Rudy Basca, these turs beat these people. I mean, I won't explain what they looked like. They beat them with gun poles, smashed them because they didn't want to they didn't want to shoot. Chucked them in the hut and set fire to the hut. Terrible man. 
the one the one female she survived and she crawled out and and and, and CJ CJ was was talking to her and, and that's where we got the story and then and then she died because you know when that when that thatch goes up and that starts a dreary it's bloody hot and CJ said no this is wrong you you don't you don't treat people like this I said who's oh. who's, who's with me I'm gonna I'm, I'm following these guys and um, my stick oh, I'll tell you <laughs> I've always got tears in my eyes right there. Not one guy said no. All the other six, I stuck it, but so I probably we go back in days. So my stick said, CJ, we're with you. Went and grabbed any batteries that the guys, spare batteries guys had, we filled up a water bottle, any, any, any food the guys had had. We chased these guys for three days. We went right up our maps. I could, I could, I could eventually only come on the radio one every hour on the hour. We, if we, 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 we killed three of them over, over those three days and, and blood spoiled into, into Mozambique. We, we wouldn't allow to go into Mozambique, but probably because yeah. it's uh, But I mean, you know, we, we couldn't we couldn't even call in choppers because we didn't even know where we were. <laughs> we were <laughs> riding right up our maps and they, yeah. we're, just, we're just so pissed off. With the, you know, I think, you know, Tony, if they'd gone and gone bang, 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 we'd have gone, oh, shit, I'm not. Yeah. And carried on back to, back to base for a, for a one night R&R. &R. I just can't understand this inhuman callousness that some people... I, I just can't understand it uh, as a human being that you can do that to another human being. Exactly. Yeah. You know, stand there and listen to the screaming. No, I, I don't know. I don't understand it. Yeah. And, you know, the, towards, right towards the end, now, as I was saying, I know, CJ, was, CJ wasn't there because, because I was doing all the tracking when we had the monitoring forces. And, and I was showing all these guys all the breaches, all the breaches. This is where they've gone. And, and we, we used to go around at night distributing these um these posters. John, we had a feeling the cockerel is dead, you know what I mean? We were j joking that McGarvey's cock was dead. <laughs> but um but um, and, and the, the bobbies the bobbies were really they, they, they were cool guys and they, they were amazed. I remember the one guy this this summer actually said to me, I don't believe it. These people are totally literate and they're allowed to vote. You know, he said to him, Chris, this is what we've been trying to tell the people all the, all, all this time. Yeah. You know I mean? yeah. Give us a chance to bring to bring the to bring the Absolutely. The electorate up to, up to speed. Yeah. But the other thing that 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 um, that we had was that all was now yeah, now was still it, it wasn't it it wasn't a PV at that stage. The keep was still the keep. And Walls and I think Herman, I think Brigadier uh, Tom Davidson flew in. Uh, and that uh, Norman Islander. And they came up to see us and he was saying, Oh, well done, guys. And as I said, Tony Akona. I don't think it was I don't think it was seventy seven or seventy eight yeah because I don't I don't know when the keep when the when the PV actually got going I mean the big guys little band and and he said you know what he said we really thought that this was going to become a liberated end with the Honda Valley and we were, we were on the verge of giving it up he said you guys have actually turned it down eh? he said you guys and I said oh that's really that's really that kind of I said oh. I think I think you guys deserve a beer I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> The walls and the walls says the brigadier the Davis they think she buy the buy the boys a beer. Yes, that's a yes. Anyway, so we all sitting there all drinking it and, and I think maybe the Minister of Defence, Mr. Herman, they want to buy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they get on the plane, the plane takes off there. Our two IC sisters. Who paid for those beers? We said, No, Wall. She said, No, they haven't paid for any. <laughs> Shoot the bloody plane down. <laughs> uh, so so everybody ended up with about six beers. I don't think I wanted to, I wanted to say when, when we were in Matasa and my and my, my, my brain gunner went off to, to do the um to do the survey for the for the keeps. I was, so now I was I was one guy short. I I had two I had two landmines in my in my title. During during continuous um we had a we had a biscuit tin with, with down in the TV, we, we had, um, had the fuel bars, we just coming back from our resupply, had the fuel bars on the back. And the ground was so boggy and so soft, we actually just changed the tire on the fourth car and carried on, carried on driving, can you believe it? Was that um, TV 2 or TV one down in the south? I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. All I remember is a black clay. Yeah, yeah. Black clay, Jesus. And, uh, and then in, in the torso, we, 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 had a, we had another biscuit, and that thing was, that thing was boosted because we had it with the right front. And the back of the truck was still was still ten meters from the, from the from the hole, so that that just lifted that whole four or five boom, down like. Yeah, I know what it and, feels like. And, and I think I'd smack I'd smack the um, the backrest on the, on the on the back of the truck. I, I didn't realize it, and and the next morning the the, the SP guy was there with these with these lanyards, you know, with, with, the, with the AKs on the, 
one at the front and two out the back. And he said, ah, oh, let's just go down and test this thing. I'm just set up now. And as I jumped to the back of the land, I said, oh, pull the bloody muscle in my back. So anyway, so, the, so then a, a relay was coming up. And, and, and I was, I was half my stick didn't exist. So, so the, the major said to me, listen, you know, I want you up and relay because, I mean, you know, you know the handle right here. And I went up there with, with two, two bottle washers. So I ended up doing all, the, doing all the bloody duty. But, you know, Tony, from, from being on the ground and, 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 knowing, and knowing what Fire Force wanted. And, and, and what, so before I, even, before I even called Mary Grand, I was really, I was really sad. I mean, what weapons have they got? Where, you know, which direction, which, in relation to where they are, where are they being fed? Are they, are they, are they in the trial itself? Blah, 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 all this stuff. Then, you know, and then, and then I would, I would transmit all, all that stuff back. And I'd, I'd be listening in because I know the, the number of times guys I'd seen and, and, and nobody was listening in for them, you know what I mean? So, so, so we also, <clears throat> I don't know what radio it was, but, but we also had uh, the cops because, you know, the cops, the cops, um, yeah. they also had support, support units, sticks up. I remember, I remember the one stick had a strong ambush, so. And the, and that guy's wounded, so I was then like giving them stuff over there, what to do. <clears throat> and when we got back, that was just just before, just before we, we finished our camp, so like the day before, the choppers brought us back in, and uh, and uh, uh, Lindsay came up to me. And Lindsay said, "I just want to let you know that Brigade reckon that's the best best relay that that that, that they've ever had." Uh, once again, Tony, because of the experience, because because of, because of what I'm what I've done. You know, what I mean? yeah. and, and this is this, this is what annoyed me. They, they go and send six guys up who have never been in contact with and, and bottle washers. You know what I mean? Mm. Cooks and bottle washers, just just to man it. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, the, yeah. uh, the, you know the other thing as well was that when we went to that that camp down at Hot Springs where, where we killed those three, I got a hundred percent kill rate with the claim. Hundred percent. What walked in never walked out again. Mm. I think the only other guys who can claim that is, is SAS. Mm. The, the twos were actually they were they were laying landmines in the tarmac on the main road, oh. down, to, down to Bridge for Bridge, and they were they were trying to blow bridges in again. So we were ambushing right at Riverbed, and, and, the, and the seen on Google Maps exactly where we were. But the claymore down there, lack of And I just see this crunch, 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 and the you know, just see this thing moving across. I hit the hit that boom. Mm. Then you go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cow. Oh, no. so anyway, so that. Anyway, my, my sister-in-law's um, my sister-in-law's sister. Uh, I think two mines detonated on a tar road during the war, and uh, the one that detonated was under her motor car, and uh, that was near Hot Springs, and uh, it was under an RLI escort. And um, even though vehicles had gone before her, she she was um, terminally ill with cancer. And uh, she was sitting in the left front. Uh, her dad was in the right front. And um, the sister, my, my sister-in-law, was sitting in the back seat. And the car hit a mine. Um, the witnesses said that it, it turned over once into the end, landed on its wheels again. And um, she was more or less vaporized, uh, the sister with, with uh, cancer. Um, but the father and the sister didn't have a scratch on him. And so I see a bit of divine... Um, interference in that one. Quite oh, amazing. Just, I think that was just one of two or three that ever happened on a tar road. Yeah. Because I know, I know, I know that we were told that that roads department will only patch in squares or triangles. Yeah. Because that's the guy. The guys used to use a 20, 20 liter drum, heat it up, I'd go through the tarmac, take out the chunk of tarmac, lay the landmine, and, and then and then put, put the round hole back there. You know, the, the round plug of the round plug. Of the Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And also, funny enough, we did a we did an HDF with I think it was five in depth. I think I think they were out of out of um, Antali, and their OC was uh, was uh, John Pearson, who'd be my OC during during my during my NS. But I mean, oh Tony, I was I was not impressed with those guys. I was absolutely pissed off because we we were walking about I don't know about six six you know because because, because we knew the area. So other guys were sweeping, so we were to drop them off on this on this great big bloody um, this carpet. And these guys, you know, you know, we started walking about seven, eight o'clock in the afternoon. Nine o'clock, these guys were suddenly either the the they're bloody putting up bivvies and, and starting to cook. And I said, I said to the, uh, I mean, I was outranked. I was only a corporal, I was still only a corporal. I only became a sergeant when I was tracking. I said to the guys, you know, just said to the sergeant, what's going on? I know the guys they haven't slept and they, and they haven't eaten anything. I said, no, bullshit, man. Better get into position. Once you're in position, you can do whatever you bloody want to do. No, but no, look, we'll get up early and, and, and we'll walk. I said, no, no. I said, but then, you know, 
the turns could have got ahead and you've and done this. And, and yet I had the burdens to walk as well. So I mean, mm-hmm. it, as, it, as it was, I only, I only got into a position about half past four that uh, they didn't. But these guys, and they were making so much noise walking around and walking around. I mean, I, I even remember at the beginning of the war, guys taking city radios into the bush with them so they could listen into bloody forces requests. Yeah. And I, I, I told my stick, you bring that, you bring that radio with you, not a problem. Yeah. I can't guarantee that it will still be working the day after you bring it. <laughs> I said, no. Yeah. You know, I, I sort of was a guy sort of was a job that I can holiday camp. You know? I think many guys did until the shit hit the fan, and then they started to rise up a bit. Um, yeah, it was a common problem. You know, Tony, you know, Tony my, my biggest fear was because I because I knew some of the guys in, in Mustang. I mean, I operated with Hatch for every year, and I mean, I was I was I was very lucky because he, he he was a full corporal as well, and he didn't want the responsibility of uh, of being a stick leader. Uh, and, and then also, you know, you know, you get some guys who even though they just drop in there, oh, you don't know what you're doing, you know. And he just didn't want, want that type of shit. So, I mean, I did too. I see he was, was, knew all the radio procedures, knew, knew coding, read a map, and, and, he, and, he could, and he could shoot. He was a real hunting, shooting, and fishing man. Mm. And my biggest fear is that now you know these guys, you, you meet them in City Street, you know their kids, you become Uncle Mac to those, to those mm. kids. You know? my, and my biggest fear was losing, was, was losing a guy and then having to tell his wife or his kids, oh, I, I screwed up. You know, something something stupid that I did, and this is why your dad is your dad's no longer here. This is why your husband's no longer here. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I said I, I, I know this sounds stupid, but I, I was I was I was so sure of my own capabilities. You know, I mean, it didn't it, it didn't bother me. You know, I, I tried to become the best soldier that I could, so I could have that split second lead on the turn before 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 he he pulled the trigger, and it. You know, I tell you, I mean, I, I was lucky. I, I didn't I didn't lose anybody in my stick. Um, mm. I, I did have friends who were who were in other units who, who were killed mm. into military funerals, and and oh, it's it's terrible. You know, I mean, the military funerals. You know, I wouldn't say the dragon, oh, but boy, mm. get their money's worth. Mm. And I, you know, I was thinking in your in your position, Dan. I mean, I had I had three other guys to worry about. You you had you you had a help too as a, you know, I mean, as a, as a as a lieutenant. I mean, I wonder how that how that played on you. And I mean, the fact that that you lost guys in your in, in your in your um, in your platoon, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, did it, you, did you ever it, have that same? It, it, was, it was sort of daunting when I first met my platoon at um, Freund up at Wanky up mm-hmm. on the hill there. And um, I, was, I marched up the hill and there were 110 guys, uh, three of us leads or two leads and a sergeant that took a platoon each. And it just suddenly hit me, wow, that's 30 guys that I'm responsible for. Um, but, you know, our training was good. And I think... I think that what made it easy, really, is that I had such fantastic corporals. Um, you've heard the saying many times before that um, a war is actually run by the sergeants and the corporals, and I really do believe that. Um, and an officer's role was really to take on board the admin, the logistics, the planning, uh, that type of thing. And obviously, you would have to lead your men into combat as well. Um, I just thank God that I never, ever... Um, had a contact at a platoon level. Um, I was involved in some way. It was like two sticks working together. Um, but I had such great corporals. My sergeant turned out to be a complete wanker. He actually um, ran off overseas, got the company to pay for his funds. He actually deserted. And our company funds paid for his air ticket. <clears throat> but the corporals were brilliant guys. I mean, I had, um, to begin with, a guy like... Uh, uh, Theo Nell, who ended oh, up yes, yes. getting the Bronze Cross of Rhodesia. Um, what a brilliant guy he was. Huh? Yeah, he wasn't with me for long before he went into tracking. And um, he was, you know, persistent like you. He stayed on tracks for two or three days, uh, ended up bumping into a group of, about, I think, about 20 uh, separateurs and uh, got his Bronze Cross through that. But a phenomenal guy. And my other corporals were the same. So, um when I gave an instruction, whether it was leaving base or, or debussing or whatever, the guys followed it to the T. Um, yes, I've always had that fear of, of losing guys. I think we all did. Um, I was actually uh, up at Binga and, uh, in one in, in the, under Don Price, and I got leave to go back to Vic Falls on r and r You can hear this in my talk, number 95 and 97. Yes, and um, 
I did a silly thing. I went out onto the river to intercept uh, Tez rowing back to Zambia after attacking Vic Falls and going back to camp uh, on the landward side because we couldn't go back by boat. Uh, I hit a landmine and uh, lost my left eardrum. So I was back in Salisbury under the care of Dr. Fine, an ear, nose and throat specialist, um, when I got a telephone call one evening, sitting watching TV with my mum and dad. I um, can't remember who phoned me. It might have been Don or the two I see, I don't know. But he phoned to tell me that um, three of my guys in my platoon uh, back at Spinger had been blown up in a landmine. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, three of them died uh, sort of straight away or struggled along for an hour or so and then died. Um, and the fourth guy eventually took his life because he couldn't handle being um, paralyzed. And then there were other guys that had to go up to Sanger Lodge for rehabilitation. Um, the night I received that call, I, it, it was the lowest feeling I can ever describe. Not only was I had the sound of a jet engine taken off my ear, which uh, dispirited me in itself, to suddenly get this news of three guys dying and three being seriously injured. It was terrible. I just went through to the bedroom and cried my eyes out. And it's something that stuck with me forever, that we we had fantastic people on our country, fantastic men and women, and to lose one of them was just absolutely crap. But I thank God that um, I never lost any men in direct combat. Yeah. Uh, I think you ever experienced that would be, you know, take my hat off to them, would have been a really shit thing. <clears throat> As you said about being a corporate and uh, the sergeant's war, NZ Treadgold, once again, Major Treadgold, he would just say, mm. you're on the ground. You tell me you tell me where you want the stop groups. You oh. tell me where you want the stop group. Mm. He said, he said I'm, I'm looking at a map. You can see exactly yeah. where the thick bushes are. You know what I mean? So, so yeah. he, he was never one of those guys who look, I'm in charge of you. Know I mean? mm. so, yeah, yeah be, being a loot, I was always in the bush. I was never back at camp. Only once on one trip southwest of Big Falls uh, did we set up um, a combined platoon base where there were two platoons and uh, we operated from an old derelict house which is our HQ but um, apart from that I was always out in, on patrol and um, I valued the input from my guys they were really well trained and very responsive and just did everything right I can't say enough about them you know I was just thinking Tony the, the, the story I want to end with must have happened in 79 because when we, when we did our recce course I uh, I caught, a, I caught an Nguruwe, a wild pig. I threw, I, I threw my, um, I threw my FN like a, like a boomerang. I grabbed it by the flash out and I threw it across this and knocked this little, this little piglet down. <laughs> and uh, took it back to base camp. And and, and Joe, Joe, Joe was a real, he was an animal guy. I mean, he, we also traded a, a whole lot of food for a, for a python that, um, that these guys, these, the locals, the locals that had caught this python. So, so Joe said, "No man, you can't." Man. And I remember we, when we went to, um, I think, Protea Ridge in, 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 in Malsetta, he was this, this fully grown bush pig. And this thing came up to me. I tell you, Tony came up, it just popped with me. He knew it was me. <laughs> but the story I want to tell you is that I was saying, there's Hutch, big Hutch, six foot three, gentle child, one of the loveliest guys you'll ever meet. So we got into Mtali to, this is the type of guy that that, that Trey God was. Go into Mtali from, from the Holy Valley. Go and get these new radios and get rid of these radios fixed, blah, blah, blah. And then instead of coming back, and it's going to be late, go and spend the night at the... At, this is when I was bouncing on the trampoline and just looking at my shoulder. I don't know, that must be wrong. Anyway, so now, so now we're sitting there and we and we, and, uh, we spend the night then up so that so we can go back in Donny Valley during the day. And we, we're sitting drinking in the in like the lounge or whatever. And there's all these Air Force guys here and... Uh, and artillery guys and that. They were, and they, they were hitting on all these chicks. And beer, yeah. beer, me and my stick, we've all got beards and long hair. We've, we've got no insignia. We, they haven't got stable belts, nothing. No berets, nothing. So this one girl came and said, listen, I, 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 I just want to sit in your lap because these guys are, these guys are hitting on me. So I said, yeah, fine. So she came and sat on my lap and the guys. And anyway, so Hutch could feel this thing rumbling, rumbling, rumbling. I mean, he was a real gentle giant. So he gets up and he stands up on the table. He says, listen, Anybody's looking for shit here, start it with me. You gotta come through me first. And then he just burst out laughing. Because I mean, Hutch would, he wouldn't hurt a bloody fly. Sat down. 
All you do is a guy behind me. Yeah, these fucking Saru scouts are coming in the hippie open bloody place. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I must admit, we picked up a few kudos from having our beards long hair that we probably didn't deserve, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, so as I said, Tony, it was, you know, like, and, and, and like you pointed out, that, that constant in, out, in, out, in, out. It, it didn't, I don't think it did you, it did you brand because no, you, it was, you know, you'd be making decisions, as I say, making life and death decisions in the, in, 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 in the bush. And you come back, and then, and then a silly little decision. And I know you're not allowed to make that because it's, you know, you're not you, you, you're not authorized to make that decision. And you say, but this, yeah. is, this is not a big deal, you know. What I mean? Yeah, the 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 conversion from the city brain to the military brain was quite trying actually, because um, I did I was a croupier at Victoria Falls in a casino. And then the brown envelope slips through the door, and yeah. the next thing you're putting on jeans that are slightly too tight. Uh, your your brains on parties and tennis courts and swimming with the bird in a swimming pool, and the next thing you're standing in front of thirty men climbing on trucks driving down to the southeast going into Mozambique. You, yeah. you know it really messed with your head uh, to just be a civvy and then suddenly switch off and go and be a soldier and you know uh, and you go to the, the range to fire your rifle or you do a bit of a refresher course at jungle land and you shit yourself when you pull the trigger because. So done, loud, yeah, yeah, yeah. You haven't done it for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then conversely, you come back from all of that the ten, 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 tensions yeah. and tick bites and nerve blisters on your hands, and now you've got to switch off and and be all smiley at your job. It's like you in the bank, you you know. Uh, for the first week or so, I just really didn't want to talk to anybody. Not that I saw yeah. mount, mountains of action, but it's your whole. Your brain is in a totally just different uh, stratosphere, really. I mean, I mean, Tony, when I went back to school, it was, it was so loud. Everything was so loud. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I'd, I'd be lying in bed at night. I'd hear dog bark, and you know, I'd get up and have a look. That's right. But, yes. But when dog was barking at night, there was something. There was something. Absolutely. My wife actually said to me, said, you know, I yeah. think you can hear the bloody grass growing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that played on your nerves. You'd be lying at, uh, awake at night, and then you've got to get up and go to work during the day, and you're all tired and, mm. and, uh, yeah, you know, I admire the regulars for the stresses they went through. I don't, I don't think I could have been a regular jumping out of an aeroplane week on week or whatever. But um, we had our own unique uh, pulls and struggles as well, I think. Yeah. And especially, uh, I ended up running my own business after the war ended. And for those guys that uh, ran their own businesses, you know, you can imagine mm. the worry as they pushed off to Bush. Who's going to look after my business while I'm gone, you know? Um must have been very difficult, very difficult. And, and it got worse as the manpower yeah. levels dropped as and, well. Yeah, plus as well, we had guys, for instance, who were, say, for instance, farmers, mm. and, and really good guys, switched on guys, really good in the bush. Yeah. And then, of course, um, later on, they then got moved to, to part two so they could operate in, in their area. So, so yeah. we, we were losing those experienced guys, you know what I mean? We mm. were getting, I wouldn't say much, but I mean, yeah. it's, like, it's like when we got those little RLI guys straight, straight, straight out from... From the NS, so I mean, all they'd ever done was fire force. And these guys, guy gives them their six rat packs. They put all six rat packs still, still in, in, in inside the carpet box into their pack. They say, no, no, whoa, 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 but you don't yeah. need a, a box of matches. Yeah. Take the sweets and the salt tablets. Yeah. Take one tin. Take some dog biscuits. Take your margarine. Yeah, you know these guys are just packing. <laughs> yeah, it uh, takes takes time to learn. Um, Mac, it's been a really great talk. I've really enjoyed it. I, I hope the audience will enjoy it. I'm sure they will. And um, I just want to thank you for coming on board again. And uh, I wish you all the very best for your future. And uh, this this should be uploaded in the very near future. So thanks very much, Mac, for coming okay. on board. Maybe I'll come and see you in Salisbury one of these days. Oh, okay. that'll be a pleasure. You know, the nearest okay. pub's just waiting for us. Just come along. <laughs> Go well, Tony. Yeah, you too, Mac. Thanks very much, eh? Bye. Bye.